Junction, I'm so excited to worship with you today. We're going to get to worship in a few different ways, and that's going to be through song, and then Pastor Cho is going to bring us a message talking about recalibrating the way that we think about ourselves from the inside. So let's sing together. How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain. I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name Into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows Of my soul the work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy, what heart could fathom such power? changed this year and they're continuing to change. 
But one thing hasn't changed at all, and that's that we're continuing to be the church. We do that through serving, um, spreading the gospel, and sharing love to our community and state and world. And we're going to do that by continuing to pack bags of food for kids in our community, uh, buying school supplies, delivering groceries, um, checking in on our neighbor, and supporting local businesses. If you have not served during this time and you want to, please contact us. And you can do that by texting JCSERVE to 94090, or you can call the church office this week. We'd love to get you plugged in. Welcome to church. We're excited you joined us, and today we're going to continue in our sermon series on recalibrate. And this week we're going to recalibrate ourselves, and we're going to focus inwardly just a little bit. And this is something I think that's affecting a lot of people, and that's guilt. Uh, guilt is one of those things that can really cripple us. It, it can, it can really cause the joy of our life to be eroded. It can cause us to be prevented from achieving our dreams. Guilt is a real issue, and I think the Bible speaks a lot to it. So today we're going to explore uh, that topic of guilt today and, and looking at the Bible. We're going to be going over today into Zechariah chapter 3. And Zechariah is one of those great um, eschatolo eschatology books. Uh, it's one of the great books that it explores the end times, if you will be. While today we're not really going to explore that aspect of it, but I still think that it is a book that explores the end times and that today it's going to give us a solution for a, a problem that is very occurrent today in the end times. Uh, and that is the guilt that many of us face, many of us endure, many of us uh, uh, have to go through. So today I'm hoping that God blesses us uh, and begins to give us some enlightenment here on this topic today to be able to not only to have eternal life and the gospel the most important thing, but to also be able to enjoy that eternal life that he has given us in the now and now. So if you will join me, we're going to be reading Zechariah chapter 3. I'm going to read a couple of verses here beginning in verse 1. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? And now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thy iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. Let's pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, and, and God, many of us feel stained by things that maybe we've done in the past or things that maybe have been done to us. So God, today we ask that, Lord, we be set free uh, from the crippling effects of guilt, uh, that, Lord, today we know that who the Son sets free is free indeed. That, Lord, we know that we have a, an advocate with the Father that, Lord, forgives us of our sin, uh, that if we confess it to God today to allow us to experience the power of your word, the transforming power of your word, and God, let everything be for your glory and your honor and allow the, the great saving message of the gospel to go forth today. We ask it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Now, I kind of let me give you the, the situation here, and, and basically what you're seeing is the reality of guilt, our, our first point, that... What's happening here is, is basically a, an image is being painted. And this image of being, is being painted and portrayed here is almost, the, it's the supreme court of the universe, if you will be. This is the highest court there is. And you have God that is sitting there residing as the chief justice, if you will be. And you have Joshua, an Old Testament saint, if you remember, that took over after Moses and leading the children on into the promised land. And Joshua here is that high priest, and the high priest was supposed to have something on uh, of linen. It was pure, it was white, I mean, it was perfect, it was indistinguishable. I mean, it was impeccable. And then you have Satan. And Satan is here, and, and he is, if you will, be the prosecuting attorney. He's trying, to, he's trying to make the accusations. And the accusations are, look at Joshua, you know, he, he doesn't have fine linen on. That isn't white. He's marred, he's starred, he's, he's dirty. And really what this points to is it points to sin. And that is symbolic for the sin that is upon Joshua. And, and what we see here is Joshua clothed, basically now not righteous, but sin. 
And what really makes this apply specifically to Christians is that we see Joshua in his life. Joshua was the one that actually took the people to the promised land. And we know that when Moses took them out of Egypt, that was symbolic for God delivering them from sin. But once God delivered them from sin, then there was a process of sanctification. It's that process that we all work through uh, that Moses began leading. But Moses could only take them so far. And then once Moses took them as far as they could, Joshua took them the rest of the way into the promised land, into victory, into Israel, if you, if you will be. And that's important for us when we study this because there's a realization that, that in this, Joshua also represents to us someone that's a believer, someone that is a Christian, someone that is a follower, someone that's made it in the promised land. And just because we're Christians doesn't mean that our problems all go away. I mean, we still have issues, we still have struggles, we still have problems, but the good news is, is that we have a Heavenly Father that never leaves us, He never forsakes us, He is always there with us every single step of the way. And so too, we see this here with Joshua, but it's still, God doesn't make the problems disappear. God walks through us, with us, through the problem. And what we see here is this almost court setting. And in this, if you get the image, God is the Chief Justice, uh, Joshua, uh, here, he, he's the defendant. He's the one that's being accused by the prosecuting attorney, which is Satan. But Joshua has a really great attorney. His advocate is Jesus Christ. And what a better advocate could we imagine? And, and here's something to take into consideration as we unfold this scene. Romans chapter 3, verse 19 says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world become guilty before God. Now that's important to this story because the reality is that what Satan is saying was right. I mean, Joshua was guilty. And every one of us are guilty. I mean, we've all broken the law. None of us have lived up to the righteousness of God. Every single one of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But here is the, the issue with guilt, that we really need to understand it from a biblical standpoint, and this is why. Because sometimes we get guilt uh, confused with guilt feelings, and we think that if we can control our conscience, then we can control that we don't longer feel guilt. But your conscience is just like a thermostat. It's just registering something, and people's thermostats are set different. That, that's why there is something in the world we call moral relativism that some people's morals are relative to where they are, where they grew up. You know, there's certain people groups in the world that think that when they tie just a, a string uh, around their waist that, you know, they're clothed. You know, even though everything is still visible, they, they feel completely clothed. And, and we would look and think, man, that is, that is absurd. But still yet, there are people in this world that have, that, that oftentimes maybe they didn't do something wrong. Maybe they didn't see it. But maybe something was done to them, something awful. And yet they walk around in guilt when they haven't done anything wrong. Because this is the problem with guilt when we look at it from this standpoint and understanding the difference between guilt and guilt feeling. For example, if you was to take your hand and, and you touch the stove, then when you touch that stove and, and the, the, the fire and the burning goes through your hand, it travels through your nerves, it travels through all the pathways, and it reaches your brain and tells you, man, excruciating pain. And the first thing you do is, is you may go take some Tylenol and hopefully help dull that pain. Now, when you look at that, the pain you're feeling is, is just a symptom of what's happened. What's actually happened, what the problem is, is your hand is burned. And in our lives, there is a sin somewhere. There is something wrong. And it may have not have been something we've done, but it was something that occurred somewhere that caused a hurt. And that hurt is being manifested through the guilt through that feeling of guilt, and that's what's happening. Now, we try, just like the, the scenario with taking the Tylenol, sometimes we try to, to eliminate that feeling of guilt itself. Some people do this with uh, substances, and they try to, to, you know, drown out the guilt or mask over the guilt. Uh, they try various ways of trying to cope with the guilt or try to erode the guilt away from their life. But the reality is, is that none of those ways are healthy. And sometimes we even try to cast the blame on others for guilt. You know, you, you take the example of somebody that maybe went to the grocery store to, to buy some groceries and, you know, the, the guy loses his wallet. When he gets back, he blames his wife that he had to go get groceries in the first place. That we try to transfer 
our blame and our guilt upon other people. We project our issues upon others. So guilt is a very, very real thing that we have to deal with in this world that we live in, unfortunately. But here is some good news. Not only is it a reality, I want you to understand the reason for guilt. Because not only if you can understand that guilt is real, but if you can understand the reason that it's happening, then it'll help you with the remedy. So here's the reason for guilt. Satan in the Bible is known as the accuser of the brethren. That's what he does. He stands and accuses us day and night before the Father and points out every single thing of wrong that we've done. And he also is a liar. The truth is an enemy. He's the father of lies, the Bible says. And what Satan oftentimes will do is he will uh, subconsciously or, or even whisper in someone's ear to get them to commit sin. And he'll even say the lie that nobody will ever find it out. It'll be covered up. But the reality is, as soon as Satan can get his little claws in someone and can get them to sin, can get them to do something, Satan doesn't want to hide it. Satan wants to shine a light on it. He wants it to be known because Satan wants you crippled then from that because then, you know, if you're a Christian and you fall, you stumble, then he wants to point it out and say, look who you thought you were. You're nothing. You're not a child of God. No one loves you. And he tries to, what he tries to do is he tries to, if he can't take your salvation, then what Satan tries to do is he tries to eliminate any uh, ability that you have to enjoy your salvation or to walk into the power of your salvation. Because it's Satan, what he desires to do, therefore, then, is to cripple us. He desires to stop us from being able to be used by God. If you remember even Judas in the Bible, what Judas did was terrible. And if you remember, you know, Satan had, had come upon him and he betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ. And what happened is he was so ridden with guilt that he went then and took his own life. Because that was the power of the effects that guilt had on his life. Now, I do want us to understand one thing, though, that there is a, a great divide of difference in the Bible between uh, guilt and conviction. These are two completely different things. Because when we do something wrong as a Christian, it should convict us. Uh, and when it convicts us, there is the need to confess that sin uh, and to ask for forgiveness of that sin. And, and the thing about Holy Spirit conviction is it will convict you specifically of what you've done, but it won't just convict you. It will communicate to you what needs to be done to remedy that, whether it's a, a reconciliation, asking for forgiveness, whether it's making something right, you know, uh, whether it's restoring something, but it will do it. And once you are submissive to that and you say, Lord, I have sinned, uh, I will fix this and you resolve this, then it's done. It's over. And God does what was sin. He casts it as far as the east is to the west. God forgives your sins, and then he forgets your sins, and he restores you. God doesn't hold those over your head for at a later, later date that he can you know, bring them back out, so to speak. He does not do that. It's gone. But demonic condemnation, that's why we point out the difference between conviction and condemnation. Condemnation is a form of guilt. And what happens with guilt is guilt begins to weigh upon you in a feeling that you can never get rid of it that you're doomed, there's no uh, repairing it, it's irreconcilable, it's unredeemable, uh, that it's a lost cause, and that there's no hope, and that's what Satan desires, because he desires to use it to cripple us. Uh, the first thing Satan desires to use that for is people that way they never get saved, that they feel unlovable, they don't think anybody will ever love them, that anybody could ever forgive them, that they could ever accomplish anything, and he tries to plant those seeds in people to where they never come to the Lord Jesus Christ and, and experience his forgiveness, his love, his redemption, his restoration, and the fact that, that we're more than conquerors through him and that we walk in the power of the Spirit. And then our weakness, his strength's made perfect. And then the other thing Satan does, if he can't win that battle, that's his first front that he tries to win, is that if he can't win that battle, the next thing he does is if there are those that are Christians, he gets them to doubt their salvation. Or if, he doesn't, if they're not doubting their salvation to think that God really doesn't love them or they've lost it or, or they've uh, uh, somehow damaged it and now they're damaged goods and God will never love them again because they've betrayed God or they've done this. And he attempts to get you to stray as far away from God as possible because that's Satan's trick is that if he can't, one, take away your salvation, then two, he'll get you to where you can't enjoy your salvation or you can't know your salvation and walk in and experience and the blessings it up. So what's the remedy? We understand that there is the reality of guilt, that there is the reason for guilt, it's Satan, but what's the remedy? I mean, how can we fix it? If you're burdened down with guilt, I mean, how can you fix that guilt? 
Now, I will say that, you know, we do need to examine this. We need to use wisdom because sometimes there's things that are wrong with us that we need to go see a, a medical doctor for because that there can be imbalances and, and, and chemical deficiencies or chemical imbalances. And, and God's given that wisdom. You know, all wisdom's from God. Every good and perfect gift is from God. And God gives us doctors. And he gives us doctors and he blesses them with the wisdom. And God works through them to grant healing in our body. So one, there are situations where sometimes we need to go see uh, a medical professional and we need to get help and be treated. It, it's the same way as if, you know, if you have high blood pressure and you take a blood pressure pill to lower your, your blood pressure, it's the same way if there's a, a sometimes a, a chemical that is causing a certain reaction that's making you unhealthy in a mental capacity that you take something to right and correct that. It's no different. But then there's also the spiritual aspect of it. And the spiritual aspect of it is that we aren't to live in condemnation. But yet there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ. That we understand that when we fall there is conviction. But we have freedom found in Jesus Christ. And who removes that? Jesus Christ. Because if we go back to this illustration that's being used in Zechariah, this is uh, one of the eschatology scriptures. This is one of the great end times passages. But we're not specifically looking at it for the end time, but we're looking at it for a great problem that's in the end time. Is that I, I want you to see the courtroom here again. Here's God the judge, and then there's Joshua. And nobody's disputing that Joshua is not dirt. I mean, that's not being debated here. That's not being argued. It's not being discussed. The reality of it is Joshua has some dirt on his clothes. But all of us do. I mean, there's none of us that don't have something in our closet, some dirt on our hands somewhere. I mean, as long as we're in this flesh, I mean, we're never able to live to perfection. We just can't do it. I mean, that's part of the problem of being in this flesh and living in a cursed world is that we can't live to the expectation that God has. That's why we need His salvation so much. That's why we need His forgiveness so much. That's why we need His redemption. That's why we're so thankful that we praise Him and sing how glorious His mighty name is because He redeems us, He loves us, He forgives us, and He continually corrects us and brings course of action to get us back on the path to Him. But I want you to see this passage here. When it says in verse 2, it says, the Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem. Rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now, the person speaking here is at least a forerunner of Jesus Christ. Uh, this is a person that is at least a, a prefigure of Christ. And I want us to understand this Bible verse that occurs in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. It says, my little children, my little children which he's calling out to the people of God, my little children. He says, these things I write unto you that ye sin not. So no one ever says that sin is good or that we can go sin all we want or do this. Sin's bad. We need to avoid it at all costs that we can because it brings pain, it brings hurt, it brings nothing good. We need to avoid it at all costs. But as we said before, we're in the flesh and we can't avoid it at all. We can't avoid it completely. So I love the rest of this passage when it says, My little children, these things are right to you, that you sin not. But here's the rest of it. Listen to this. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. That if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. And he is the propitiation, that is, he is the satisfaction for our sins and not for ours only, but for the sins of the entire world. So that's good news. Therefore, those that are in Christ, there is no longer condemnation. Now, when we sin, we're convicted by it. We confess from it. We cleanse ourselves. But then now we walk through. And now we're okay. Now we're back rightly restored. That is the good news is that Jesus Christ took our guilt and shame. When Jesus Christ died, he didn't just give us eternal life. I mean, that's a, a byproduct of what he did. That's an amazing and it's a great thing he did. But that ain't all he did. Because he took our shame, he took our humiliation, he took our downfalls, he took our shortcomings, and he took our guilt. And I like this right here in verse 2 when it also says, Is this not a brand plucked out of the fire? All of us were at that point in time where we were in death. We were uh, right away from hellfire and judgment. We were a brand plucked from the fire. And if you're a Christian today, 
no matter what you're facing or how you're feeling, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing can pluck you out of his hand that's already plucked you from the fire. And today I want to encourage you that if your feelings of guilt, that man, maybe you felt like you hadn't measured up, maybe you, maybe somehow you walked away from God, that in this that you know that God is calling out to you, that, that God wants to do a work in your life, that God loves you, that God still desires a relationship with you, that God is not finished with you, that this is the next chapter of your life where God's going to begin to write something amazing if you'll just come to him and confess him. If you'll confess him, Christ will cleanse you. That he'll take the, the unrighteousness that we have, the dirt, the grime, and he'll wash us perfectly clean. And maybe you're here today and, and, and maybe you've never been saved. Maybe you've never called upon the name of Christ, but maybe you can realize today through this message that Satan has been feeding you a pack of lies. That you are worthy. That you are loved. That God does care about you. That God will forgive you. That God will redeem you. That you can have eternal life. That you are loved. You are accepted. That today if you'll confess your sins and you'll believe on him, that something amazing will happen in your life. And that one, you will have now a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You'll have eternal life, but also have the Holy Spirit living and residing inside of you. What an amazing thing that is. So I want to encourage you today that when guilt comes knocking and Satan comes whispering those doubts up in your ears, that when he reminds you of your past, you can remind him of his future. That one day, death, hell, and the grave have all been defeated. And one day we will be with our Heavenly Father and rejoicing with Him. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. God, we thank you that we don't have to live with guilt. We don't have to live with shame. That, Lord, we can trust in you. And that, Lord, we know that you are faithful and just to forgive us. And that, Lord, while we avoid sin, we know that, Lord, sometimes it happens. God, we thank you that you're an advocate for us, faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. So God, today, if there's any out here that, Lord, need to receive salvation, that, Lord, they might call upon your name, they might confess they're a sinner, and they might believe that you died upon the cross, and, Lord, three days later, you rose out of there. And, God, I pray today that if they do, that they reach out to us, that, Lord, we can get them resources, we can pray for them, and we can welcome them into the family of God. Lord, we thank you, and we ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus. Even when we can't or have a hard time forgiving ourselves, God already has forgiven us. He shows us grace and mercy every day. He knows everything you've ever done and He loves you anyways. There's nothing that can stop you from the love of God. He's going to continue to pour out His grace and mercy. But can you give yourself that same grace and come to Him? He has a plan unique just for you. He made it just for you because He knows that you are worth it. If you need prayer, please contact us. If you'd like to accept Jesus or you want to know more about Jesus, you can text JC Saves to 94090. And if you'd like to continue to support the ministry here at Junction, you can give online at junction.ky. There's an online giving button right on the homepage. We love you and we hope to see you next week.